Okay, if you say so. She said that whole house was sick, Jeremiah. The whole house was sick? Mm -hmm. you know, so they, she got the shop closed down for a little bit while they um, healing. I don't know. I don't know if it's a bug or if it's the other thing. You might need to steer clear from them. 19? For a good little while. Mm -hmm. Who are you feeling? I'm not going to uh, I'm not going back to sleep. My hair is traumatized. Because <laughs> I'm trying so to get... Silver does the job. I don't really want... I want to get my two transfers. That's what it is. Okay. All right, I'm live. How much will it cost for me to get my two transfers? Uh, you going to need to call the person that's doing it, son. You want me to practice on your head? Hmm? I say, you want me to practice on your head? That would be affordable, but at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> you know hey, girls. Know. Hey, Anita. Greetings, Abba girl. Auntie Belinda Brown. Ema set apart. Hana Vinette. Greetings. Hey, girls. Hey. Happy Monday, y'all. And also everybody else here hanging out in the background. Top of the morning to you. All right, beautiful people, it is November the 21st, 2022, day 269 of year four, of reading through the books of the Law and the Prophets, another four-year consecutive day count, we are on day 1,288. Yep, and today we start a new book in a waspy, the book of Ashong, son of Jehovah, and this is the God of the second cycle after man's creation. Um, then once we get done reading a couple chapters here, we're going to hop over here. We'll probably only read two. We're going to hop back over to the Field Guide to the Spirit World by Miss Susan B. Martinez. All right, y'all. Father, we thank you for time to watch consistency as you show consistency to us throughout nature and all things, and even with perpetual steady growth of our physical body we can learn a lot about consistency just by watching nature oh, i strive to be more consistent <laughs> in my daily working out very good what time you get what time you leave okay all right are you paying attention to your gas needle yeah the car that we suck up gas out of all that job that i did it's not even past the first thing okay just remember keep your eyes on the time all right. All right. Animalistic nature. Peace. All right, y'all. Page 42. Book of Ashong, son of Jehovah, God of the second cycle after man's creation. Chapter one. When God and his lords of heaven and earth had lost their heavenly dominion, the swift messengers that constantly plied through the atmosphere and, and ethereal worlds bore the report to Jehovah's kingdoms in Etheria. The earth had passed the Gion eddies at Shrapa in the Ethereum roadway, high a bok yiv, and was heading for the eastern fields of Anacron, having entered the Danhanian arches of the Hittavi, where lay the great kingdoms of the Orion chief, Howie, and with his millions of gods and goddesses and high-raised Ethereans. Before high we came the swift messengers, fresh from the heavens of the earth, with their pitiful tales of woe that had befallen the inhabitants thereof. How we said, I behold the red star, the earth, O Jehovah. I have heard the tale of horror. What shall be done, O Father? I might add that in the title, tale of horror. 
What shall be done, O Father? Then spake Jehovah, saying, Call thy tributary chief, Ashon. Let him hear the will of Jehovah. Then sent Howe for Ashon, who had dominion over the fields of Anacron in Etheria, through which lay the roadway where the earth was to travel for three thousand years. And when Ashon came before the holy council of Howe's million gods and goddesses, the all light, remember, all light is another name for creator or Jehovah, which, he, which he's also called for the majority part of um, all the books. But there's a few different names that they refer to him as. Zachariah, who shalom, shalom, dawn, happy Monday, sis. Key, hey girl, hey, happy new day. We're on page 42. Verse, let's go back to seven. And when Ashon came before the holy council of Howie's million gods and goddesses, the all light fell upon the throne like a sun, and the voice of the creator spake in the midst of the light, saying, Howie, my son. And how we answered, Here I am, thy servant, O Jehovah. Jehovah said, Behold the red star, the earth. She entereth the fields of Anacron. She is dripping wet and cold in the Gaean eddies. Her gods and lords are powerless in the spell of darkness. Send thou thy son, Ashon, to deliver the earth and her heavens. For behold, I will bring them to his door. Then spake Ashon, saying, Thy will be done, O Jehovah. Though I have been long honored in Ethera with many Ethereal worlds to command, I have not as yet redeemed one corporal world and her heaven from a time of darkness. Jehovah said, Go then, my son, to the laboring earth and deliver her. But first, appoint thou a successor for Anacron. Then spake Howie, who was older than the red star, who had seen many corporal worlds created, had seen them run their course and then disappear as such. Prince, shalom, shalom, peace and light, blessings. I believe y'all change our name. My friends from the UK, I think so. Just by the way you greet us. All right. Listen, so remember, um, somebody, trying to remember who it was yesterday, they uh, made a mention of... Um, um, do all the worlds, and I'm I'm probably messing the question up, do all the worlds like go through the same process? Or is this, I forget who it was. I'm going to have to go back and look um, through the chat. They asked pretty much, does this happen to every world? And I said, from what I understand, reading through a waspy, this happens to all the worlds that come into existence. They go through all these different phases, right? So let, me, let me read verse 10 again. Then spake Ashong, saying, Thy will be done, O Jehovah. Though I have been long honored in Ethera, with many Ethereal worlds to command, I have not as yet redeemed one corporal world in her heaven from a time of darkness. Jehovah said, Go then, my son, to the laboring earth and deliver her, but first appoint thou a successor for Anacron. Then spake Howie, who was older than the red star, who had seen many corporal worlds created, had seen them run their course and then disappear as such. He said to Ashon, send thou to Juan and to Hivigat in Ethera and get the history of the earth and her heaven and obtain thou also an account of her harvest of brides and bridegrooms to Jehovah. And thou shalt call from my realms as many million Ethereal angels as thy labor may require and with them proceed to the earth and thou shalt have a line of swift messengers established betwixt this place and thine and that and by the power of Jehovah I will answer thy prayers and whatsoever thou shalt need so just like we um read about uh the painting of this and how uh there was a line of light um extended from the heavens all the way to John Nubro in 1800s when he was pinning this. They also do that. Um, they have lines of light connected to the angels. We want to call them angels, messengers, whoever's here, the gods, goddesses. They are also they also have that line of light unless they defect from the Creator. Then they just turn over to the dark side and they just wreaking havoc everywhere, mess with everybody. I'm gonna go back to verse 12. 
Then spake Howie, who was older than the Red Star, who had seen many corporal wars created, had seen them run their course and then disappear as such. He said to Ashon, send thou to Juan and to Hibigat in Ethera, and get the history of the earth and her heavens, and obtain thou also an account of her harvest of brides and bridegrooms to Jehovah. And thou shalt call from my realms as many million Ethereal angels as thy labor may require, and with them proceed to the earth, and thou shalt have a line of swift messengers established betwixt this place and thine, and by the power of Jehovah I will answer thy prayers, and whatsoever thou shalt need. Then Ashon went back to Anakon, his Ethereal kingdom, and before his holy council made known to Jehovah's will. I'm sorry, made. Hold on. Then Ashon went back to Anakon, his Ethereal kingdom, and before his holy council made known Jehovah's will and his. And Ashon called for sixty million volunteers to go with him on his mission, and they came presently, some from Johan. Some from Tessim, or it could just be Sing, he could be silent. Some from Sing, some from Arath, some from Ganlu, and some from various other places in Anacron came in millions, came as many as Ashon called for. So Ashon raised up a successor to Jehovah's throne in Anacron, and he was installed and crowned according to the discipline of the Ethereum heavens. And Ashon sent swift messengers into the former roadway of the earth to obtain its history, its harvest of brides and bridegrooms. Then gazed Ashong toward the red star, and his 60 million volunteers also gazed and watched her as she coursed along in the arches of the Hitavi. Thus Ashong, well skilled in the course and behavior of worlds, gathered together his millions of angels trained in artist enterprise and furtherance of Jehovah's will. Quickly, they framed and equipped an Orion port, port, Ar, port Argon and illuminated it with firelights and bolts. And these sons and daughters of Jehovah embarked and sped forth a half a million miles, even on the outskirts of Anacron, and they stood close above the earth, almost so near that the sweeping moon would touch down would touch the down hanging curtains of Ethereum fire. And here they halted that both mortals and angels belonging to the earth might behold and fear for such Jehovah made man by unusual sights to become weak and trembling, to change him to new purposes. Jehovah's, hey son. Jehovah's voice spake to Ashon, saying, For three days and nights stand thou in the firmament, that man on earth and in atmosphere may behold the power and majesty of my chosen in heaven. Ashon said on the fourth day, O Jehovah, I will cross Chinbat. On the fifth, descend toward the earth. Bring me, O Father, thy messengers from the lower heaven. I will converse with them. Jehovah sent the angels of the earth and the lower heaven up to Ashon, disheartened they came to know Jehovah's will. Ashon said unto them, The Father's hosts are come from their highest state and glorious ease to redeem these fallen heavens and man on earth. It is our labor to come in love to the helpless and teach them how to sing in Jehovah's praise. Then the swift messengers answered, In the all persons boundless love, Find thou recompense for thy holy words, most honored God. Down in darkness, long and earnestly, have the lords of the earth labored conjointly with the heavens God, whose kingdom fell. Alas, our God, who ministered over the lower heaven, is crushed and humiliated. The enemies of high heaven, exulting in their spoil of Jehovah's kingdom and his name, mock us, saying, Where now is Jehovah? Whence cometh the higher light? O ye faith is in an all person boundless. And now thy high shining sun, thy ship of Ethereum fire, maketh the sons and daughters of the earth and her heaven to look and to fear and to tremble. And after tremble is reference number one. And number one at the bottom says two, two is in brackets, T-O, look, to look, to fear, and to tremble. And two, T-O, before the look, fear, and tremble is all in square brackets. To look, to fear, to tremble.
I'll go back up. Verse 24, I'll read it again. But now thy high shining sun, thy ship of Ethereum fire, maketh the sons and daughters of the earth and her heaven to look and to fear and to tremble. And when thy light appeared, we made all haste and hope of succor. Our souls are more than filled with thankfulness. And in Jehovah's name, we will back and employ a million trumpeters to proclaim around the earth and heaven, Jehovah is come. After due salutation, the swift messengers departed, and Ashong made all things in readiness for his descent when the proper time should arrive. Chapter 2. What's dead? I'll put it on my charger. Oh, it's not. It was just off. Okay. Chapter 2, we at the bottom of page 43 on the left-hand side. B.C. Shalom Shebrew. Hey, girl. Hey. Angels of the earth are lords, right? Key. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they're considered lords. Yeah. Yeah, lords. Lord gods. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, according to this, they are. Yep. And we can see it all through the Bible, too. We see them. Those are the main ones interacting with everybody right chapter 2 jehovah spake to ashong saying on the evening of the third day shalt thou move thy ethereum ship toward the earth and when thou arrivest within and within and arafon a-r-r-a-f-o-n and when and when thou arrivest within an arafon Thou shalt halt for another three days, that thy magnificence may all the men and angels of earth with the power and glory of my emancipated sons and daughters. And after Arafon, it's reference letter A. Hold on, let me take my blue bookmark. And so remember, the <clears throat> letter references are at the end of the chapter. I'm sorry, not the end of the chapter, the end of the book. The number of references are at the bottom of the current page. Okay, so <clears throat> on page 51 is where you'll find it. And A says, an aerophon is about 20,000 miles, 1882 edition. Tabitha, hey girl, hey. All right, chapter 2, page 43. I'm going to just reread uh, verse 1 over. Jehovah spake to Ashong, saying, On the evening of the third day shalt thou move thy Ethereum ship toward the earth. And when thou arrivest within an Arafon, or within 20,000 miles, thou shalt halt for another three days, that thy magnificence may all the men and angels of earth with the power and glory of my emancipated sons and daughters. Ashong proceeded as commanded, and when he came within an Arafon, halted for three days, and the magnificence of the scene overcame the stubbornness of men of earth and angels in atmosphere. Again, Jehovah said, Proceed again, my son, and when thou art within half the breadth of the earth, halt once more, and making the place thereof a plateau, and it shall be the place of thy abiding for the time of dawn, which shall be seven years and sixty days. <clears throat> and from this time forth, my Ethereum host shall not remain in atmosphere more than eight years in any one cycle. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hold on, let me get some water. I'm sorry, y'all. Verse 4, <clears throat> and from this time forth, my Ethereum host shall not remain in atmosphere for more than eight years in any one cycle. This then that I give to thee shall be like every dawn of Dan, some of one year, some of two or three or four or more years as the time requireth. And thou shalt dwell in thy kingdom seven years and sixty days, and the time shall be called the first dawn of Dan, and the next succeeding shall be called the second dawn of Dan, and so on as long as the earth bringeth forth. And the, 
and the time from one dawn of Dan to another shall be called one Dan Ha, and four Dan Ha shall be called one square, because this is the sum of one density, which is 12,000 of the earth's years, and 12 squares shall be called one cube, which is the first dividend of the third space in which there is no variation in the vortex of the earth. And four cubes shall be called one sum, because the magnitude thereof embraceth one equal of the great serpent. And that the great serpent is letter B. Hop to page 51. And B says, these numerical gradations, square, cube, sum, refer to the periods of spiritual light and darkness through which the solar system passes as it travels through Ethera. Remember, great serpent is also known as uh, the, the, the solar system, the, the planetary belts and stuff, right? The great serpent. These, numer these numerical gradations, square cube sum, refer to the periods of spiritual light and darkness through which the solar system passes as it travels through ethereal. The implication is that these cycles follow a repeating pattern over time. This concept is expounded upon in God's Book of Men and in Book of Cosmogony and Prophecy. Okay, so go back to page 43. Zachariah, who shalom. Did I say hey to you? I think I did. I probably did. I think so. All right. Verse 7, page 43. Ashon proceed again and moved within 4,000 miles of the earth. And the voice of Jehovah commanded Ashon to halt in the place and found a new kingdom using all things requ requisite to that end. Jehovah said, Thy place shall be a distance away from the earth, that thy dominion be not disturbed by the confusion of the fallen angels thereof. So also, to as many as thou shalt redeem away from the earth and from mortal contact, the distance of thy kingdom will prevent them returning. Ashon perceived as he proclaimed what Jehovah had spoken to him, and the host cast out, and the host cast out fast fastenings to the plateau that the kingdom together with the ethereal sea of fire <clears throat> might rotate with the earth and its atmosphere jehovah said make strong the foundation of thy place and erect ten thousand pillars of fire around about and in every direction provide roadways and mansions but in the midst thou shalt build the house of council wherein shall sit thy host of dominion during dawn. Ashon built the place as commanded by Jehovah. And when it was finished, Jehovah said, thou shalt call the place Yeshua. All right. So before we had the Yeshua person, Yeshua was a place, a place truly of salvation or rest and relaxation away from all the shenanigans here. Ashon built the place as commanded by Jehovah, and when it was finished, Jehovah said, Thou shalt call the place Yeshua, and it was so called because it was a place of salvation. Again, Jehovah said, Choose now thy counsel, my son, and also thy sub-officers, and when thou hast completed the list, leave in Yeshua the sub-officers, and proceed thou and thy counsel of one million men and women with thee down to the earth and heaven thereof, and cast thine eyes upon the inhabitants, for they are in distress. And when thou comest to the place of my lords and my God, deliver thou them and bring them to Yeshua, for they need rest. And many, and as many of the Ehims in heaven as are capable, excuse me, <clears throat> hold on, I almost went down the wrong pipe swallowing. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. And when thou comest to the place of my lords and my God, deliver thou them and bring them to Yeshua, for they need rest. And as many of the Ehims in heaven as are capable, bring thou also away with thee and give them into the care of thy people. Ashon did as commanded, first selecting his council and his officers, and then he and his host proceeded to the earth as had been commanded. 
And that is the end of chapter two. This figure, I believe, goes with this next chapter. Um, yeah. Maybe. Oh, no, 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 no. Because it's talking about the distance of 20,000 miles. So let me show it to you. Plate two on page 44. This is like the A-Shawn. Okay. Okay, so this figure right here, it has B, C, and E right here. This figure. Okay, so this first picture at the top has the letter B, and then it has the arrow. The arrow under the arrow is C, and uh, you have the big nucleus atom looking thing. It's dark. Okay, so you see around the outside, the lighter portion of it, it has A, the letter A, and within side of it is the letter e right and i'm not sure because it's so dark the inside the darkest part if that has a a letter in it but at the bottom it says a represents atmosphere which is that the big circle thing at the bottom with the lightest portion going around it a that's considered atmosphere and then b up at the top it looks like a handkerchief or something falling that's etheria e represents earth which is the lightest part of the circle at the bottom earth okay so this is ethereal right the outside i'm sorry no a is atmosphere b is ethereal c is the distance right which is twenty thousand miles and you have e which is right here which is earth okay He said, Revelation 12, 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Oh, yeah, that kind of looked like it, it kind of go, right? You know, referring to it, that's crazy. Just to think in Revelations, it says great serpent will be thrown into the lake of fire. Yeah, that's an interesting point, Key. Okay, so we at 28 minutes there. We're going to pause right here. Because if I read chapter 3, we're surely going to end up at about 50 minutes. So we're going to pause right here. Um, I'll, I'll wait for that. Okay, so let's hop over to the field guide to the spirit world. Can we pause on page 103? And so the last thing we talked about yesterday. Yes, sir. So uh, don't forget, life is perspective. So always be loving and think of it in the bright light. Much love, y'all. All right, son. Think of life in a bright light. Okay. Um, so yesterday we talked about the uh the making of a vagabond. You know. The uh 12 steps to raise a delinquent child. I mean, which is the same thing, right? So that was the last thing we talked about. And clearly we know you don't follow those directions, right? It was meant to bring light upon parents who are not really paying attention, who are not really paying attention to some of the things that they're doing, getting children everything they want and all of that stuff. Do the opposite of those things, right? Because you create kids who thinks the world owes them everything and they don't have to work for anything, right? So that was the last thing we talked about. Just, that's lousy parenting, really, right? Okay. Jamia, shalom, shalom. Okay. So on page 103, under those three asterisks is where we begin. A bright and handsome paranoid schizophrenic, schizophrenic named Herb Mullen killed both men and women at the urging of voices that directed him to make blood sacrifices for the sake of the environment. Mullen had a fierce delusion about preventing earthquakes in California. They could be avoided according to his telepathic voices by taking some lives. Final count, 10. When he was a small boy, he had argued, quote, Jesus could not possibly fit into the communion wafer, end quote. 
I mean, that sound like something a, a child would say that actually makes sense. When he was a small boy, he had argued, quote, Jesus could not possibly fit into the communion wafer, end quote. Later, he spoke of, quote, lies designed to induce naivety and gullibility in young children, thereby making them susceptible to receive and carry out telepathic orders, end quote. That's an interesting way to look at that. The child shaped and trained to submit to fixed ideas remains predisposed to the controlling touch. He is like wax to the unseen powers in search of a host. Psychic research for well over a hundred years has been geared toward identifying those entities that come into a person's presence, whether that person is schizophrenic, psychopathic, mediumistic, or simply harassed by a spiritual parasite. Quote, such an entity, end quote, Avers Eugene Morey, 1988, page 120, if strongly negative, may, quote, urge the victim to commit murder, end quote. Otherwise put, Dr. Wicklin viewed this encroachment as capable, <clears throat> as capable of resulting in, quote, bestiality, atrocities, and other forms of criminality, end quote. Wicklin, 1974, page 20. The case of Dennis Radar, BTK killer, is instructive. Once captured, he tried to explain, quote, you don't understand these things because you're not under the influence of Factor X, the same thing that made Son of Sam, Jack the Ripper, Harvey Glattman, Boston Strangler, Hillside Strangler, Ted of the West Coast, kill, which seems senseless, but we cannot help it, end quote. When asked to explain Factor X, Radar replied, quote, I just know it kind of controls me. How can a guy like me, a church member, raise a family, go out and do these sorts of things? I actually think it's demons inside me, end quote. Wenzel et al., 2007, page 66 and 308. Quote, where spirits usurp the corporal body, Holding the native spirit in abeyance, such spirits shall be known as daemons, or what we call demons, end quote. Owaspi, Book of Bond, chapter 14, page 9. Demons, although demonology went out of fashion a long time ago in the civilized West, and after West, there's an asterisk, and at the bottom, the asterisk says, demonic possession is still recognized today in 360 out of 488 societies surveyed. Davis, 1985, page 215. And I'm gonna just read the sentence at the top over. Demons, although demonology went out of fashion a long time ago in the civilized West, apart from horror movies, its non-existence really can be attributed to more political correctness than to the evidence at hand. Those we rely on for expert opinions have come up with sterile labels like paranoid schizophrenia or episodic discontrol that only distance us from the psychogenesis of lunacy. And when it comes to explaining immensely brutal and irrational crimes, the veneer of expertise breaks down entirely. Our flustered analysis now washing his hands of the problem by calling it subhuman behavior quote such persons are completely utterly inhuman end quote morrison 2004 page three quote the depths to which human beings can sink suggest subhuman forces end quote markman and bosco 1989 page 192 quote this guy goes beyond the study of human behavior end quote laverne's 1997 page seven quoting a psychiatrist's comment on Ken McDuff, Texas serial killer. Said a prosecutor in another homicide case, quote, there are some people who are just outside humanity. This is not a human being, end quote. Nathan Smith, 1995, page 286. Their gods are criminals, Tabitha. I don't disagree with that. Her whole comment. She said, um, these false gods will steal the creator elements and then make up their own story with it 
So, Ki La Olam, your quote is on point. Oh, talking about the Revelation 12 and 9. And, um, and BC said, Tabitha, just like the kings of the earth have taken land and tried to rent it out. I know, that just blows me. Let me keep reading. And control people with it. Rent it out and control people with it. And Tabitha said, so BC, we see where the kings got their thieving attitude from. Their gods are criminals. Right, BC? As above, so below. That was good, y'all. All right. I'm back to page 104. But even the man on the street can do better than that. In fact, the offenders themselves have had extraordinary flashes of insight that the, quote, experts, end quote, have chalked up to self-serving vindication. For example, when Danny S. told his lawyer that he, quote, entertained the thought that I was possessed by demons, end quote, his lawyer said, quote, cut the bull, Danny, end quote, Nathay and Smith. 1995, page 135, David Berkowitz, son of Sam, wrote that, quote, people feel a certain eeriness about me, something cold, inhuman, monstrous. This is the power and personality of the demons, end quote. David emerged from childhood with, quote, overwhelming feelings of rejection, end quote. Given that the absence or depletion of self becomes a standing invitation to the unseen ones, we can better understand David's statement that, quote, unclean spirits will fill the void, end quote. Klausner, 1981, page 363 and 57. Quote, might it be possible, David asked, to convince the world about the dark spirit forces that live on earth? I would die for this cause, end quote. And clearly we know, oh, I speak clearly breaks this down, that they do live here on earth. These are the ones who have defected from creator, right? They want to linger around earth. They refuse to grow. They engrafting themselves upon mortals, their kindred, right? Some of the shards, the lost control, they don't know what to do. And like, they looking for you, sure. Where's the place of salvation? Because these mortals down here, I don't know. I need a rest. Listen. My, quote, might it be possible, David asked, to convince the world about the dark spirit forces that live on earth? I would die for this cause, end quote, from his prison diaries shown in his own neat handwriting in Lord Lawrence Klausner's book, Son of Sam, quote, phantoms, end quote, David wrote, quote, came into my head, end quote. The voices urged, quote, get her, kill her. End quote. Quote, demons were clamoring for blood. Wicked, wicked demons. End quote. That, that lines up with what Owaspi teaches us, right? With the blood sacrifices and things like that. Slaughter this. They're pouring out the blood and let the, flail of, the, the smell of cooking flesh come up into their nostrils. Like, yeah, they, they seem to be on point. Some of their studies in our time. Well, yeah, yeah. Because we was, we was all here in 1981 for the most part. I think, I don't think. Yeah, because I was born in 79. Like, I mean, I had just got here. <laughs> Look, quote, phantoms, David wrote, came into my head, end quote. The voices urged, get her, kill her. Demons were clamoring for blood. Wicked, wicked demons, end quote. Klausner, 1981, page 83, page 106 and 170. Berkowitz's prison diary also declared, quote, I am possessed. I am a person who has been visited by an alien force or being. I was doing nothing more than what the demon voices commanded. The demons ran amok in my apartment, end quote. Insightfully, he wrote, quote, I know that if the police set up a, quote, demon task force, that's got to be in the title today, demon task force, end quote. No, quote, I know that if the police set up a demon task force, then a tremendous step would be taken. Society also needs to erect a demon hospital in which suspected cases of demon possession could be treated. End quote. Klausner, 1981, page 15 and 46. That, that is a marvelous idea, I think, right? Because right now, I mean, they kind of got that. But they not truly treating it for real. They just drug them up. We call them insane asylums, right? Imagine. Just look. They probably wouldn't name it 
demon task force or demon hospital they're gonna give it some politically correct name right just giving it that name will probably wake the whole world up like wait a minute why y'all calling it that right people went there like uh keep on now <laughs> they're gonna send them folk to take you to the demon hospital or to the the uh the demon task force gonna come get you them folk gonna be the demon task force taking you to that place where the folk take people to when they acting crazy quote i want to be sent to a mental hospital to get the evil out of me end quote arthur shawcross quoted in olsen the misbegotten son for page 441 we might call, we might recall the case of Susan A who strangled her own 8-month-old baby. She had presumably, quote, developed delusional ideas about being possessed by demons, end quote. Loon 1976 page 99. Dairy CM Shalom Shalom. Jeffrey Cosmo, peace, love, light and balance, Cosmonians. <laughs> Yeah, you know, right, Tabitha, she said, after listening to people like David and many others, they are struggling with demons, with demon influence. I'm having sympathy for the criminals, right? Yeah, and a lot of people, they aren't really prepared to help these people, right? And so most people in the world, they don't really know, especially if they're not spiritual. They don't really understand what's happening to them. They just like, mm, stay away from them. They crazy. Like, no, no, no. They, they crazy, crazy. I ain't just saying because... I don't like them. No, they crazy, crazy. They, they, they missing a few cards from their full deck, right? And people just kind of, they just, they, they like the people, like people in charge, just put them somewhere else where we don't have to deal with them, right? And it, it is, my heart really goes out to them, you know, because they're surrounded by people who don't know how to help them appropriately. The best thing I'm just, just put them somewhere else, you know? And you have some people, family members who love them and they, and they let them stay in their homes or whatever. And they look after them, but they get frustrated because they, they're they not as spiritual as they should be to recognize what's really going on. Right. And if they are sort of spiritual, you know, they're trying to cast the devil out by calling on Jesus and it ain't working. It's like, well, why ain't Jesus showed up? And that, you know, that just opens up a whole nother plethora of questions about christianity and what you believe in deliverance and you know is you know we might recall the case of susan a who strangled her own eight month old baby she had presumably quote developed delusional ideas about being possessed by demons end quote loom 1976 page 99 was it really delusional not according to the lights of the vatican and its time-honored rite of exorcism the Ritual Romanum. In 1970, after the arrest of Dean Coral, the deranged Texas multicide with 27 kills, the Vatican's daily Les Sovator Romano commented on the case, quote, we are in the domain of demons, an evil force, monstrous, end quote. The editorial's reference to the, quote, dissolution of a man, end quote, seems to tally with Coral's non-person of a self. The unwanted child, an unwanted child, he grew up into a young man shrouded in, quote, a cloud of silence, end quote, and casting the blank stare of the psychopath, quote, like the walking dead, end quote. Elements of his story have a familiar ring, helpful and polite, isolated, severe childhood illness and subsequent blackouts, arrested cognitive development, similar, similar to rate, what's that? Similar, similar, sim, 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 similar, to rate, S-E-M-I-L-I-T-E-R-A-T-E. -E -E. And it's in quotes and, and parentheses. His mother married and divorced five times was at once a religious fanatic and flashy dame. Though critical and demeaning of her son, her reaction to his crimes amounted to a wall of denial. Quote, I would never believe these terrible accusations. End quote. Olson, 1975, 
Page 261, 214, 82, and 212. And after terrible accusations, there's another asterisk after accusations. And down at the bottom, it says, This denial is not uncommon. Arthur Shawcross's mother from hell declared, quote, There's nothing wrong with my son, end quote, even though he killed 15 people. The Boston Strangler's mother, quote, I don't think he could hurt anybody, end quote. Frank, 1966, page uh, 315. Well, that's good, Tabitha. She said, I'm no more going to advocate for execution, but maybe life in prison. Yeah, yeah. Right now that we know some of these things, especially when they felt like they didn't have any kind of control, right? It's like somebody else getting tickets in your name while you, like your body was dead, but you were blacked out. Yep. They caught you on camera. Like you got to pay for all these fines, you know, but technically it was somebody else committing the crimes. And it's like, and some of them like, man, I'm really innocent. I mean, I know y'all seen my body, but I wasn't really there. Like it was, it, it was it was somebody else, really. And some people look at them like, you would say anything to get out of trouble. And these people are really telling the truth, right? Ema said, it's arrogance as far as the medical profession is concerned to admit that possession exists. Absolutely, I agree with that, right? Don said, exactly, right? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Something as simple as inappropriate laughter may be a clue to derangement. A tale, especially if it comes unbidden. Joe Callinger, the shoemaker, tried to shut out his uproarious laughter, quote, by holding his hand over his mouth, but it had a personality of its own. He wondered whether the laughter was the part, was a, excuse me, was a part of the demon, end quote. That hoarse laugh of his, quote, gushed forth, Hold on. That horse laugh of his, quote, gushed forth without outside provocation, and it was accompanied by compulsiveness. It just took over, end quote. Joe said, a force was manipulating me. I didn't know what it was, but it had to be something other than myself, end quote. I've actually seen this. I've seen this in church. Pass will be preaching, and this gentleman, like, and, and this particular pastor, this time, um, he wasn't like, he, I mean, he had a sense of humor, but it was like a dry sense of humor. And it, it wasn't, um, and he hadn't told one of his like little small jokes or something that people would think is humorous. And, <laughs> you know, it wasn't any of that. Just right in the seriousness of the message, dude just bust out. And every, of course, everybody in the church like, Looking around, everybody. when everybody saw everybody else did like that, everybody kind of like turned around like quit being nosy. And now everybody looking out the side of their eyes and stuff. Like it got so bad that he would take his hand. Like he'd be looking. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I didn't, I understand it now. Because when I read about it, his face immediately comes back to me. Um, him and this other woman. Y'all bless her soul. I... I don't know where she is, right? I ain't gonna say her name. I, I said her name before. I don't. I don't even think she uses social media. Um, but anybody that was with me at that particular church quite some years ago, they would remember her. At least my my two oldest children do, Elijah and Jeremiah. Um, but yeah, this gentleman, he would be looking. He would be like, it would be like an uncontrollable laugh. Like you know how sometimes they talk about like the 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 spirit of joy taking over and people laying on the floor laughing and so like you see some of this stuff in charismatic churches, right? It was like another whole level of this. I Man, I get that. And, um, sometimes you get the spirit of joy, spirit of laughter, or whatever comes upon you, but nothing like that. It was something like I said. It was something else, and I'm just like. That's something, something is wrong about that. I don't, I don't think that's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but literally, he would literally have to get every time it would happen. It wouldn't happen every service, but almost like every other other service. Like be two services good and that third service, boom, something happens about midway through the message. Then that laugh takes over and he's just trying to calm it down. And he got his hand over his mouth and he's doing like this. And he just like gets up and he's walking down the aisle. Like, and it's like, I'm like, oh my gosh. And you can hear him out there in the hallway. And I'm like, I'm like, father, what? It, like, seriously, I used to ask questions. I'm like, 
he looking crazy right now. I'm like, I don't think you drive your people to do stuff like that. Because I say, like, let me check. Fruits of the spirit. Isn't one of the fruits of the spirit self-control? It don't seem like he can control that, right? So little things like this, I'd be paying attention to. Even in church. And like I say, this one lady, it's probably been a year or so since I mentioned her. We call her Miss Sophia. Uh, uh, oh, the white lady. She was the sweetest thing. She really was. But she, she like when she put on her makeup, not not to make not to make fun of anybody, but like she would always come to church dressed to the nines in her mind, right? But to us, it looked like you might have got dressed in a dark sis, right? <laughs> One day she came. She had I don't know. It, I could just tell something was off. Like I said, not to make fun of anybody. And she listen, listen, she wasn't old, old. And no disrespect to anybody who's up in age, right? I say older. She had to be, I want to say Miss Sophia. She she probably wasn't like 60. She was probably just like late 50s, right? Uh, um, She wasn't, she was like medium size, but not. She was probably maybe just a little bit smaller than me, right? But she would sometimes come to church wearing, um... She would, she would have on stockings most of the time, but one particular time she had on stockings and she had socks on over the stockings. I'm like, I didn't think it was that cold out there, but okay, if you like it, I don't know that I love it, but all right, whatever. But they would mismatch and it wasn't like Halloween or anything. It wasn't like spirit week, <laughs> at least not for anybody else. You know how sometimes you have, you have spirit week in high school, you do, do do like crazy dress day and stuff like that. Like we, none of that was happening, but she would also have this crazy uncontrollable laugh. Um, and that was the one when I talked about it the first time, cause she used to wear a lot of different wigs and I'm just, that, that baffled me because I didn't know, like I said, no disrespect. I didn't know white people wore wigs, right? But like she would have on like this different type of wig. Every time and she, I've seen her with her hair, I'm like, why don't she just wear her natural hair? Um, but, you know, sometimes bad hair days, whatever. I get it. I get it as a woman, right? I, I used to wear wigs and sew-ins and all that stuff a lot. Um, but what would happen is when she'd come down to the altar to get prayer, and I get it. She probably was really trying to get free of whatever it was that had a hold on her. Because anytime there was an altar call, Miss Sophia was down there walking down there in her heels and stuff, you know. But it, it, she didn't have like Parkinson's or anything like that. I mean, she walked into the church fine talking to her, but anytime it's time to walk down there to the altar, now that I think about it, I'm thinking the demons on the inside of her, the spirits that were sharing her house, they probably started acting up and they was probably trying to keep this. Don't go down there because you know, pastor and this particular pastor, this particular pastor, I know as one who not only knows the father, but I believe the father truly knows him, even though still using like name, the name of Jesus and all that, but people who are true in their walk with the father, there's just a certain power that follows them, no matter what name they're using, especially this is what they're taught, but they are, they're truly genuine and pure at heart, right? So this was this particular pastor. So anytime um, she would come down there, she started doing this little shaking of her heels, walking down there and holding on to her wig. <laughs> And mind you, it was me and my husband, and it was a lot of other young couples in this church. And so anytime Miss Sophia get her ear about it, we looking around at the other couples in the church, and we elbowing our spouse, like, oh, here she come, here she come, what she going to do today? And here come Miss Sophia walking down the aisle, holding on to her wig and stuff. I'm like, why she always holding on to her wig when she get down here? You know, when she get down there, and before Pastor even touch her, and he be trying to keep a straight face, but sometimes he would just bust up laughing, turn his head to the side, and be like, Miss Sophia, we're going to cast this double out of you today. And then when the pastor loses it, then the whole church just kind of get into an uproar. And she'd be laughing too, like he wasn't making fun of her. But some things, it's just like, you can't keep a straight face preaching when you got somebody full of shenanigans coming up to the front. It's like, you got to address it somehow. But... He would eat, wouldn't even like get close to her before she starts shaking, doing this laugh like, <laughs> you have to be there to get it. But she would start doing all like this and everything. I'm like, you know what? This woman is doing the most. And we thought it was funny. I, did, I didn't really understand it then. We just knew it come in Sophia with her crap. But now I'm like, oh my gosh. 
Miss Sophia really had some crap going on with her. Like, and we didn't recognize it. Yes, Dawn, holding on to her wig, right? And so when she would get slain in the spirit, <laughs> somebody always, when she got up there, when Pastor started coming down out the pulpit, somebody needed to help and get up there. Because Pastor, he's like, look, I don't, I don't want no cases up in here with somebody in the hurt where she done fell and broke her hip. Y'all see her coming. Just get up there. And my husband at the time, he was the pastor, well, one of the pastors, armor bearer. And so he, he looked, if, if, it, if it was his Sunday to be up there, he see Miss Sophia coming. He just cut his eyes because <laughs> he'd be up there by the, by the pool pit. And I'm like, don't let Miss Sophia hit the floor. <laughs> we be cracking jokes and We're supposed to be paying attention. We cracking jokes and stuff. Me and my husband are acting a fool quietly amongst one another. Um, but when she would go down, like I said, Pastor would get ready like little people like, he could have not even been ready to put his hands on her forehead right he could have just been lifting his hands to the father like father why does she keep coming down <laughs> we cast the devil out of her and try to every sunday every, like every sunday right but it don't seem to be going nowhere i'm just like where is jesus at <laughs> Why she keep coming down here? Like, didn't you cast this devil out last week? And she had something every week. Like I said, I'm telling it in a in a funny way. But now that I look at it and some of this stuff that I understand now, I'm like, man, that wasn't really funny. And she was literally coming down there every Sunday because she wanted to be free. But she would. She would, um, on her way to the flow, she would grab her wig. And if her wig didn't fall off while she down there on the floor, you know, doing whatever it is and kicking her feet and stuff. Sometimes I was like, one time I was up there because if it's a woman, they normally have a woman, but I was also working in the, the camp, we call it the camera ministry. I would be working a camera sometime. But when Miss Sophie, look, they probably look at some of the camera like, camera's like, Pam, what are you doing? First of all, why you keep zooming in on Miss Sophie? <laughs> Make sure y'all get good footage on what's happening down here at the altar, right? So me and the pastor so was on the other. She go down there. I'm just like paying left, zoom in, and when she get on the floor, sometimes like when I wasn't on the camera and that be closer to the front, and she hit the floor, and I would look at her. Sometimes when she done flailing around, it's about ready for her to. Get, she figures about time for her to get up. She do like this. Open one eye and look around. I'm like, Miss Sophia playing down there in the Lord's house. Somebody get this woman up this flow. But she would, and she would, she would, she would check her wig. Not when she was about to get up. She would check her wig in the midst of being slain in the spirit down there. Like, Jesus, Jesus. Fixing her wig. I'm like, oh, why is all this going on in the Lord's house? Those were some of my best church days ever. Best church, hands down, that I ever been in, right? There was some shenanigans, but it was the best church. You can't ever ask my husband. He's like, you know what? That was the best church experience <laughs> that we ever had. You know, so I get a lot of my funny stories out of there. It, it, it's crazy. It's crazy. I still interact with a lot of people from there. Um, but, yeah, that... We learned a lot in our younger marriage days. That was actually, I think the laughter that came from that church was a big part of what saved me and my husband's marriage in them early days. Like, we was, when we was going there, we was having them petty, petty early marriage partner fights. And it was like, you know what, I can't wait to Sunday to get here or, or Wednesday or something. We beating down the doors of the church past. I'm, I'm, I'm sick of this nigga <laughs> doing stuff like that. And so we be, uh, Every every other week, James was leaving, going back home to his parents' house and stuff. Or so he said he'd pack his bags and be like, well, fine then. When you leave, you need me to take you to the airport? And he was like, yeah, after church, I'm going to go. So after church, Pastor always talked some sense into us because he knew we was full of shenanigans. And he'd kind of help us from the pulpit because it was a bunch of young couples in there. And apparently, and apparently... All of the young couples, because like I said, we was all young, like early, early 20s young. Um, so apparently a lot of the couples were having issues that they was going to pass about. So instead of a lot of the individual counseling, which he did, he 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 spent a lot of his time counseling us vagabonds. 
But all the stories he would get without saying names, he would help us from the pulpit. He's like, all y'all here is crazy. No, he wouldn't do that. But he he was a, that past, he was a real comedian. We learned a lot. Like I said, that's where we really learn how to use uh, true laughter in our marriage to kind of get through some things, right? Learn how to look at ourselves and things aren't really so bad, right? How to just kind of laugh at life and grow from it. Kids are sick up there. You can put a tear in your face. I, heard, is really... I, I heard her coughing. I know that. I understand that. Um, also, can you please explain to your nieces that... Because <laughs> they argue with me like, boy, you come to think, nigga, I got school. Bye. So am I. You can see them after after school, whatever. Matter of fact, um, no, I think the campus is gonna be closed on Thanksgiving anyway. The campus is gonna be closed on Thanksgiving. They should tell y'all that. All right, bye. Go get out of here. Yeah, get out of here. Yeah, look, listen. When I say you, I learned so much. Um, I I learned. I started learning a lot of spiritual things there because, like I said, now that I'm going through this, a lot of this stuff was happening at this particular church i didn't realize how much spiritual um education we was getting there um uh, like now now that i look back i'm like oh my gosh yeah i understand this because my first running and experience was why we was going to this church because this particular pastor he had a, a very active spiritual life and he was <clears throat> he was involved in a lot of uh what we call deliverance ministry and he had all kinds of stories we had different types of people that would come to the church looking for deliverance like different levels but he would also go out to different places preaching and he he brings some of the stories back when he come back and just kind of share different things and how people was delivered different things and and we would wonder how you know how sometimes people get delivered and they truly like deliver even in, in jesus name but i really don't believe it has anything to do with the name it's about the vessel whom the deliverance is coming through right and that person because they are they're truly in line with the creator even if they're ignorant of true names but there's like a true connection a true relationship which is why there's a difference where some people actually get delivered and some people who have to keep coming back for deliverance. It's, it's just a it's a few different things you have to take into account when it comes to people getting delivered, right? The vessel that deliverance is coming through because they have to be in a higher light, a higher place and truly connected with the Father or in line with the keynote if a true deliverance is going to take place. Otherwise, them spirits that's there is not even going to listen, right? And they're going to they be like, Jesus, I know Paul, I know, but who is you, right? Better go and get up out of here, boy, and lend me your clothes too. They run out of run out there screaming and naked, right? Um, like when um I shared the story about my son when my nephew had helped this girl run away and something overtook him. And that was the first time I realized, because I thought before I did it, I was like, should I call on Jesus? But then it was just like a boldness rose up on the inside of me. And I never called on anybody. I said, you are going to leave and never return. And it immediately released my son. And I didn't say the name of Jesus or anything, right? But I'm truly connected with the Father, right? So that's what I realize and what I understand about authority. Because even if you... um. Even if, <clears throat> how can I say this? Using the New Testament, Jesus didn't walk around saying, you know, casting people out in the name of Jesus because he was Jesus, right? But using that example, we'll use them as an example. Um, the, 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 the true person being in line with the creator, there's just a certain authority that you get. Just like when you leave your house and you leave the oldest child in charge. They, although they are not the parents, they have the authority of the parents and they don't, if they are walking in true authority as the parents have taught them and hopefully they taught them appropriately, they should just be like, go ahead, go in there and clean up your room, right? But some, they'll be like, go clean your room because mama said, it. I'm going to go back and tell. Oh, we need to train you a little bit more because you shouldn't even have to add our name on it to validate. They should recognize that you walk in authority when we're not here. Go clean the room. And I ain't got to say in mama name or in daddy name because I said so. Go clean the room, right? 
Um, so that's one thing that uh, we really have to understand authority and its proper workings. So, so but. Um, I guess the temperature dropped crazy last night and yeah. the whole car is frosted. What you about to do? You about to. Use water, hot water to get the ice off. I can't see anything. Though. Okay, it's so right what's going to happen? Because it's still real cold out there, right? Yeah. It's going to freeze up. And you have ice all over your windshield. So let it heat up a little bit. <laughs> You've been up since the butt cracked the dawn. I didn't even know. I, thought it was, uh, I didn't even know a car was going to be like that. I didn't check the temperature with everything. Again. Uh, just give it a few minutes. Let it heat up. Turn the, the heat up on the inside. Turn up. Open the vents, make sure it's on the one, but give it a few minutes. Let it defrost naturally first before you start doing that. Yeah, that, that's a little bit safer. Just, just give it a few minutes. Hold on, what y'all say? Say lot. What's up, bro? Hold on. Oh, Tabitha said, uh, Pam, I believe what you were saying about some people, what you are saying about some people, they have that anointing, even though they call the creator differently, right? Yeah, that's something I really paid attention to. But you have some people, they were like, if you don't say the name of Jesus or whatever, I'm, and I get it. And I stopped arguing with people because I, I understand it just, I ain't going to say a little bit better, but I have a, a different, maybe you can call it a higher understanding or whatever, because people who truly walk in the authority of the creator, even if you call him names of gods, right? The creator... I'll say the creator isn't as petty as we are. Let's just put it that way. Because he is the one who can see and tell the intents of the heart, right? And so things for different people just work. So pay attention to the details of certain things, right? Um, yeah, so, okay. What do we pause? And we at, let me, let me, I'm going to keep going for a few minutes because I want to get past this chart, the the table 4.2 what is it malign or malign laughter okay so back on page 106 um yeah the second paragraph where it says something as simple okay something as simple as inappropriate laughter may be a clue to derangement a tale, especially if it comes unbidden. Joe Callinger, the shoemaker, tried to shut out his uproarious laughter, quote, by holding his hand over his mouth, but it had a personality of its own. He wondered whether the laughter was part of the demon, end quote. That hoarse laugh of his, quote, gushed forth without outside provo provocation, and it was accompanied by convulsiveness. It just took over, end quote. Joe said, quote, a force was manipulating me. I didn't know what it was, but it had to be something other than myself, end quote. Schreber, 1984, pages 84 to 85, page 151 and 169. Clearly, an automatism, the same bizarre gales of laughter came from Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, who'd erupt into spells of, quote, laughing uncontrollably, he could not stop. It was a 10-minute job. Sheesh, end quote. His teddy boy, his teddy boy friends noticed, quote, you just say something and he busts out in hysterical laughter, really effing loud, almost rolling on the floor. It were one of, it says, it were one of them laughs where it screeches out, he shout out like a right shrill shriek and the whole pub looked around, end quote. Burn, 1985, page 37, 43, and 58. Ken McDuff, a serial killer, also issued, quote, manacle laughter at things no one else thought were funny, end quote. Laverne, 1997, page 16. Sometimes it's the multiple MPD who does this, like Alex, whose, quote, laughter was weird and inappropriate and never touching his eyes, end quote. C. Smith, 1998, page 116. Martin Ebon, 1974, page 72, has noted that, quote, one who talks loudly or laughs long may be possessed, end quote. The diabolical laugh, in fact, 
is so often met is so often met with we will have to condense our findings and summary and summary form in table 4.2 and 4.2 is on page 107 okay so um it's three columns the first one is who the second one is the crime and the third is the description okay so the first one is dr dale cavanis he killed his son that was his crime description quote big laugh end quote especially in connection with his practical read sadistic jokes dale would quote burst into his loud laugh a kind of rippling guffaw ha 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 he double up with laughter end quote o'brien 1989 andrew cunning 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 his crime four homicides his the, the description quote an extremely boisterous laugh so obnoxious you could hear the brain cackle for blocks away end quote wash 1998 pages 214 to 215 like the joker and batman yeah yeah it, yeah in that listen that's right uh uh bc so there's like a <clears throat> There seems also, look, I just thought about it with your comment. BC said, laughter can be demonic and tears can be expressed joy. Imagine, and tears can express joy. Imagine that. When you said that, I thought about how, like, laughter, like, there's like, okay, so let's say this way. You know you got, like, the fruits of the spirit, right? Self-control joy peace patience all of those things right but there's like an extreme of those things where people like tilt the scales to where it's no longer like a balance it's like something else has stepped in like joy but it also talks about scripture talks about how laughter is like a medicine and it do with the heart good clearly it does right i would say i don't say one of my gifts but i'm able to present things in a in a manner where we can laugh but it's not overbearing you know and it's not um it's not abusive but it's a way to teach where you can learn to look at things and laugh at yourself and mistakes and kind of and you can pull the lesson from it and you can learn but there's also an extreme of that where you go overboard and this is that right even ocd right we would think cleanliness it's a good trait to have, right? The Father teaches us how to be clean. Wash your tail a couple times a day, at least once, right? Clean yourself, right? Now there, there is there, there is an over extreme of that where you got people OCD, right? And they're constantly cleaning, and we can tell something is off, right? Something is off. There's extremes of things that should be balanced, and you can you can see it at both ends of the spectrum, but that balance is the balance that the creator wants us all to be at. We got to find a balance in between the two extremes, right? Because one extreme is like you are a, you, you put the, like if we look up neat freak in the dictionary, your picture is there, right? But then you got the other extreme of that where you are absolutely filthy and we need to just burn down your house. I got matches who got the gasoline, <laughs> right? But there's a balance. Um, I just thought about that with your comment, right? Listen, okay, so that was Andrew Cunningham. If I said his name wrong, I'm sorry. The next one is Diane Downs, shot her children in cold blood. That was her crime. The description, laughed at inappropriate moments, e.g. all through her trial. Friends could not help but notice her near hysterical laugh. The next person, Paul Keller, his crime, he was an arsonist. Description, his father described Paul's, quote, inappropriate behavior, such as laughing when another child fell down and hurt himself, end quote. Douglas and O'Shaker, 1999, page 60. Eric Napolitano, serial killer, quote, laughed heartily, end quote, while torturing women and also in court during his sentencing. Pinsiak, 1996, page 177. Dennis Rader, BTK killer. He emitted a, quote, sharp, high-pitched cackle, end quote, as he described a kill to the cops. 
Wenzel et al., 2007, page 275. Richard Ramirez, Night Stalker. Everyone noticed the, quote, high-pitched hyena cackle, end quote. He let out right he let out right in court. One victim recalls Ramirez after setting her free, letting loose with an ear, letting loose with an quote eerie laugh end quote. Gary Ridgeway, Green River Killer, as he was quote beating her with the rifle's butt, he started laughing manically. End quote. Wu, two thousand four, <clears throat> page two four seventy two. Odie Shawcross, serial killer, quote, for no apparent reason, he threw his head back and emitted a high cackle trailing off in a low loon-like warble, end quote. Kathy Wood, nursing home murders. Her aunt remembered her, quote, outbursts of extreme laughter, end quote. Cockle, 1992, page 431. When John List familiarized laughed, quote, it was like strange. He was, you might say, programmed, end quote. John himself admitted, quote, it's like I had no control all the while I was doing it, laughing like some force, something beyond my control, end quote. As for the killing, he said, quote, once I started, I was like on auto drive, end quote, Sharky. 1990, excuse me, page 237 and 302. And in the case of Ed Gain, whose story inspired the book and movie Psycho, even as a boy, he was in the habit of laughing at weirdly inappropriate times. Gene, stalker killer, was raised by an abusive alcoholic father and a crabby, impatient, domineering mother, quote, a Bible-obsessed religious zealot who created a willing religious captive in Gein, in Gene. I don't know how you say this name. G-E-I-N. Is it Gene? Gein? I think it's Gene. We're going to go with Gene. End quote. <laughs> Morrison, 2004, page 51. Her, quote, strong ideas about religion and morality were fanatically impressed upon Ed and his brother Henry. Neither Ed nor Henry ever married or had sex, end quote. Douglas and O'Shaker, 1998, pages 366 to 71. Gene, incidentally, could not recall the killings, said he was, quote, in a daze, end quote. He felt he was driven to his ghoulish activities by an ir irresistible force that he said invaded his mind from someplace outside himself. See table 4.1, Ed Jean on page 84. Let me go back to page 84. Yep, page 84, uh, table 4.1. This was Murder and the Voice. And Ed Jean is the one next to the bottom. It's the killer's name, the crime, their experience, and the source. So it's Ed Jean, serial killer. His dead mother spoke to him. Source, Douglas and O'Shaker, 1998, page 371. Okay, go back to page 108. Um, ooh. I do, I do have a little bit of time. I do this morning. I know it's Monday, but my first, uh, my first meeting is not to nine. So let me just, let me finish reading this because I want to keep this together with this, this laughter and stuff. Okay. If y'all got to go, go ahead and get out of here. All right, but we'll be done shortly. Uh, we at the middle of the page, quote, it's hard, it's very hard to be possessed by unknown forces, end quote. Norman Simmons, South Africa's Station Strangler, Wrestler, 1997, pages 180 to 81. One finds a similar description of the haunting of Gary Gilmore, quote, there was now a terrible spirit living inside him. That awful ghost had somehow gotten inside him, end quote. Gilmore, 1994, page 115. Indeed, the metaphor of choice, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, pops up regularly whenever an unknown force emerges as factor X in a crime. California's sadistic sex killer, Zodiac, for example, quote, seemed to change into yet another personality like Jekyll and Hyde. 
Gray Smith, 1987, page 210. Harvey Glattman's lawyer used the same comparison for the madness, quote, burning inside him, end quote. Newton, 1998, page 280. Dr. Mark Dr. Markman, 1989, page 146, recounts that the wife of another killer, quote, came to think of her husband as a Jekyll and Hyde, end quote, so sweet and charming sometimes. Gary Ridgway, Green River Killer, quote, was a totally different person, end quote. Rule 2004, page 597, when he began to molest her, the one girl who actually got away, Oh, that was the end of the sentence. Let me reread that. Gary Ridgway, Green River Killer, quote, was a totally different person, end quote, Rule 2004, page 597, when he began to molest her, one, the one girl who actually got away. Of Arthur Shawcross, nice guy and do-gooder with violent mood swings, it was said, quote, all his misbehaviors seemed to follow from unknown forces, end quote. Arthur himself wondered, quote, if I have been living two different lives, one of the psychiatrists said I was a Mr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, two people in one body, end quote. <clears throat> Olson, 1993, page 442 and 490. The otherwise mild-mannered and sensitive Danny Starrett was, quote, transformed into a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, end quote, his defense declared. Danny himself wrote, quote, I started picking up somebody else's thoughts. They simply were not my thoughts. More and more, I began to view them as belonging to another person, end quote. He called that other person him, quote, there was no stopping him. The head turns, but I'm not turning the head. When the head turns, I can see the girl sitting in the car in the next lane. If the girl turns off the freeway, he, and every time it's he or him, it's in capital letters, he pulls in behind her and starts following her, end quote. Nathan Smith, 1995, page 328 to 29. Nazarene is saying shalom into the goat. Hey, girl, hey. We're on page 109 in the field guide to the spirit world. <clears throat> I'll go back up. Um, to he called that other person him. He called that other person him. Quote, there was no stopping him. The head turns, but I'm not turning the head. When the head turns, I can see the girl sitting in the car in the next lane. If the girl turns off the freeway, he pulls in behind her and starts following her. End quote. Nathan Smith, 1995, page 328 to 29. Template of the charming but deadly, quote, lady killer, end quote. Ted Bundy described himself as a, quote, very nonviolent person, end quote, who nonetheless killed dozens of girls in his call in his cross country rampage. Apparently, quote, there was a hidden Bundy, the quote entity, end quote, as Ted first described him to me, a deviant killer who collected and preserved his victims severed heads. It was the entity who sought credit for the murders, even as the public Ted this this dignantly i'm sorry this not this is in i'm reading the word backwards even at hold on it was the entity who sought credit for the murders even as the public ted indignantly disclaimed them mccall 1998 page three through four in his prison revelations ted always spoke of himself in the third person saran saran the paranoid schizophrenic who shot Robert Kennedy as commanded by a, by quote, a voice, end quote, always, quote, referred to himself in the third person, end quote. Wrestler 1992, page 42. Likewise did a possessed woman in India, quote, speak of herself in the third person, end quote. Osterich, 1935, page 213. Disassoci I'm sorry, disassociated people can do this. Marie No, child killer, quote, seemed as though she was talking about somebody else, end quote, while describing her own, quote, monstrous actions, end quote. Glad 2002, page 185, quote, 
He should be studied, not buried, end quote, said Albert DeSalvo, speaking dissociatively of the Boston Strangler himself. Frank, 1996, page 252. Dennis Rader, BTK, quote, was a Jekyll and Hyde, end quote. During the manhunt, he wrote a letter speaking of the guilty one, quote, he, emphasis added on he, has already chosen his next victims, and I don't know who they are yet. The pressure is great, and sometimes he run the game to his liking. Maybe you can stop him. I can't. Sheesh. End quote. Wenzel, 2007, page 322 and 29. I'd like to mention... <clears throat> Yeah, yep, you're right, uh, Tabitha, uh, Robert Kennedy's killer in this mix. Page 110 at the top. I'd like to mention one curious cluster of behaviors that frequently forerun the homicidal career. The combination starting in pre-adolescence pre of bedwetting, animal torture, fire setting is a strong sign of escalating violence. It is known that the McDonald triad or the, quote, homicidal triad, end quote. Oh, I mis misread this. I mean, I read it right, but it was a period there. Listen, let me start over. It is known as the McDonald triad or, quote, the homicidal triad, end quote. More than half a century before crime analysis identified the homicidal triad, the scriptures of Owaspi honed in on those unholy discarnates pulling the strings. Quote, vampire angels nestle in the atmosphere of mortals, while evil angels obsess mortals for murder's sake to make mortals burn houses and torture helpless creatures. Emphasis added on burn houses and torture helpless creatures. Owaspi, Book of Spencer Armige, chapter 2, verse 2. <clears throat> quote, evil angels, end quote, and this quotation refers to ex-mortals, members of the human race who have passed into spirit, but who return, quote, to mortals purposely to inflict them with pain or misfortune, end quote. Owaspi, Book of Bond, chapter 14, verse 16. Let me just stop here and say that Miss Susan B. Martinez has done an excellent job we're bringing some of this stuff together and bringing light and giving us real time real like real time examples from our time where we can see what we've read in a wasby it's like proving the points right and especially if you had a lot of supernatural experiences or training you can test and see that some of these things are true like Owaspi is is it's a it's a hidden treasure of spiritual wealth inside of here all right, and if you still those hanging out in the background, if you still not quite sure, I would say read this along with the Bible. Right, help bring some clarity to things. Um, as as like I um sorry, as well as the Essenes Gospel of Peace, bring read all three of them together. It's gonna bring a whole lot of light to some things, right? And you get a more balanced picture, and you will stop coming off them extremes at each end, right? And bring you right here to the middle ground. Okay. Page 110, the prosecutorial phrase, quote, personification of evil, end quote, may be more apt than we realize. Lacking physical bodies, evil spirits must find a mortal outlet, latch on, and quote, possess human beings. These earthbound spirits are the supposed devils of all ages, byproducts of human selfishness, false teachings, and ignorance, end quote. Wicklin, 1974, page 18. Roger DePew, one-time chief of the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit, thought that, quote, evil is more than a vague notion. It is an entity. It has reflexes and intuition. Those who do not believe the devil walks this earth have not seen the things I have seen. End quote. DePew, 2005, page 7. When juvenile records are sealed, we may lose all evidence of the homicidal triad. This is unfortunate, as it is the keenness of warning signs. Nevertheless, we are now aware of other symptoms of malign or malign invasion, 
portents that that serve as harbinger of an obsessing entity. Be on the lookout for the darkened eyes, the malevolent laugh, and copious grimacing. And after um, portents that serve as harbinger of an obsessing entity, it has an asterisk. And the asterisk at the bottom says, Exorcist Eugene Morey would add one more indicator to this list, a certain stench. Quote, the terrible odor indicates the presence of a strong killer entity, extremely dangerous. End quote. Maury, 1988, pages 120 to 21. The inhabitants of hell, quote, carried the foulness of their hells with them. End quote. Owasby, Book of Liga, chapter 14, verse 7. That is true as well. Like, <clears throat> if you ever smelt somebody, now you just talking about somebody that might be homeless or whatever that ain't been able to shower somebody no there's like a there's i've seen a couple people like and i just as i read through this i just get like flashbacks of different scenes in my life where i've encountered things i'm like what in the world and i i'm not quite sure well i wasn't sure at that time what those certain things were but now i can clearly see it i'm like oh snap First of all, Father, thank you for your protection in those times where I found myself. But it always seemed like those, when I say I got a lot of stories, I got a lot of stories. There are, um, there are situations that I run into that, and it could be like subtle things to other people, but it's something about that certain situations that stick with me. And now I'm realizing now some of those things that stuck with me, it, it stuck with me for a purpose, um, so I could recognize and once I get the understanding of certain things, right? We're going we're gonna to hold on to this. Put that on the shelf, but we're going to make sure you remember that smell, right? And they don't, they look all well put together, clean, everything. But there's a stench that follows you like, is that, wait a minute, you got something on your shoe? Like that's, that's too potent to just be on the bottom of your shoe, right? Like those type of smells. It is, this is crazy. Let me go back up. When juvenile records are sealed, we may lose all evidence of the homicidal triad. This is unfortunate, as it is the keenness of warning signs. Nevertheless, we are now aware of other symptoms of malign invasion, portents that serve as harbinger, right? Or harbinger is, um, it's like a warning. Mm, 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 mm. These things will serve as a harbinger. Hey, the check engine, like, hey. Pay attention to this right here. This is what you need to be looking at, right? That's a harbinger <laughs> trying to get your attention. Like, hey, hey, they're loud, loud. It's a, it's a loud warning, right? That's what I understand a harbinger is, right? Nevertheless, we are now aware of other symptoms of malign invasion, portents that serve as harbinger of an obsessing entity. Be on the lookout for the darkened eyes, the malevolent laugh, copious grimacing, Corporal, Corporal Layla, Corporal C O P R O L A L I A, Corporal Layla, I think that's how you say it. Hey, babe. Mm -hmm. Corporal Layla, which is streams of obscenities. You'll see somebody walking down the street and they just like cursing. Or remember on uh, the series uh, 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 Lovecraft Country, remember when it was in a house and uh, tick got demon possessed and he was just cursing and stomping. That's what you call corporal layer, if I said that right. Just outbursts, streams of obscenities and cursing. Logoria, rapid, effusive, non stop speech. So be on the lookout for those things, right? The presence of a spiritual parasite may also be gleaned by what I can only call the unnatural gate. The FBI is not unaware of this warning sign and have, on a few occasions, included it in their profiles. Example, in 1992, while tracking down career criminal and serial killer James Wood in Idaho, investigators put together a quick profile with the help of behavioral experts at Quantico. Our man would be a loner, strange and compulsive, possessed of a beer belly, driving a beater and possibly walking with a limp right i know like oh make you she said make you smell your 
I'm sorry, that was Kevin. Kevin said, make you smell yourself just to make sure. Is that? Hold on, hold on. And for women sometimes. <laughs> like, seriously, those type of smells, they make you do check over yourself. Like, wait a minute, something ain't right here, right? And so now I'm aware of these things. It's just like, ooh, let's go. Oh, hold on. Sometimes you can be alone and a scent foul just past your nostril. That piques my attention all the time. Sometimes it could be a pleasant scent. I have experienced that as well. Not so much like the foul smells, like when I'm by myself, but I often get smells of like fresh flowers. And although I have fresh flowers in here, sometimes, let me tell you the first time, I really paid attention to this. This was after I had that atopic pregnancy. And my sister was actually here because she, she got permission from the hospital. She was working at, it, at that time to come help me recuperate, right? So but during this time, a gentleman named Paul Wilbur, y'all heard of Paul Wilbur? He's a, a he's a well known in like the Jewish community. Uh, he, he has a lot of music or whatever. But anyway, the, um, the congregation I was attending at that time um, was a, a messianic place right they actually had sunday church services but they were coming together with the hebrew and jewish community so on fridays they would have shabbat and you know so they they all these services would be held while there and it was and i thought it was really good how they're bringing together like truths from christianity and messianic kind of bringing like a higher truth than what most churches would so we found this particular place and we call it like going to temple synagogue whatever you want to call it i was like we're going to the church house right but anyway, Paul Wilbur had come, and he often frequents, um, and we haven't been there in years, so I'm not sure if he still come, but I love his worship music, right? And he'd happen to come. And this particular, this, it was a Friday. It was a Shabbat um, service. And so I was feeling a little bit better. I had a little bit more wind back in me. So I was like, I definitely want to go there. I, I just want to sit in, in just the midst of the worship and everything, right? You know, I just had the etopic pregnancy, lost the baby, all this stuff. I just, I just need to sit in here, right? <clears throat> so we was there. We were sitting up on the balcony. And Paul Wilbur, of course, he down there doing his thing. He talking to everybody, playing some, you know, worship songs and stuff. And then there was like this pause, right? And I've never talked to Paul Wilbur like a day in my life, right? And nobody inside the church... Uh, in, inside the, the Messianic community that was there knew what had happened to me, except for maybe like a couple family members, but they weren't like talking to the people. They definitely weren't talking to Paul Wilbur. And so when he was up here, he was doing the worship and it was about halfway through. And um, I really like him because I, I truly believe Paul Wilbur is one of the genuine ones, like, you know, and the father speaks to him. And so he said, you know what? He said, he said, Abba just told me he said, there, there are a couple of you. He said, there are a couple women in here who have had either maybe a miscarriage or something happened with pregnancy where something went wrong. And he said, be comforted and know that I'm watching out for you. That's kind of summing up what he's saying. And he said, and don't worry. This, this one, and mind you, I had, because our two oldest children, Elijah and Jeremiah, they're seven years apart to the day. Elijah was born May um, 22nd, 1996. Jeremiah was born um, May 22nd, 2003. It took, not that I was trying to get pregnant, but I just couldn't get pregnant. I didn't realize I had an internal issue going on on the inside of me until I had the etopic pregnancy. Um, which was a child before Joshua. Joshua was now 12 years old. So what happened was when I had it, when they did the emergency surgery, they found out, well, Miss Murphy, your tube is really scarred, and this is what happened. This is what caused this to happen. We need to operate now. You're bleeding internally. We're surprised you're, you're, you're still conscious, right? They said, because you should be in complete shock at this moment. You know, so they literally gave me and my husband five minutes to talk about it, like, like, they was just being respectful of the situation, trying to be as compassionate as possible. Like, Miss Murphy, we have to go now, you know. So they knocked me out, did the surgery and everything. Um, but back to Paul Wilbur, what he was saying, he said, um, I'm taking care of the situation. Just summing it up. I'm taking care of the situation, and don't fret. I have the baby. 
you know, the, the baby is in my care and there are many more to come, right? Now that I think about this, I'm like, he was probably specifically talking to me. But at that point, um, he also said, he said, and as a promise from the father, he said, those women should be able to smell. Uh, uh, he said, it's like, he said, cause I can smell. He's like, it's like this, this, this baby powder scent that's floating through here. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I, I said, you smell it. I said, no, I said, they playing. I said, somebody got baby powder. <laughs> there was this, it's not overwhelming, but it's like somebody had taken a baby powder, you know, the baby powder, like Johnson and Johnson. It was like somebody had taken a bottle of Johnson and Johnson baby powder and just squeezed it. You know how LeBron James is, and you see all that, that chalk and stuff, smoke come from his hands, but it was like somebody had did that right in front of my nose and before he could even get those words baby powder out i could smell it and it was so strong i'm like i'm like oh my gosh i said you smell that leash was like i said no i said no i said you hear what he just said i'm like no there is an overwhelming uh smell of baby powder and i'm like i said excuse me y'all y'all smell that and they looking like no baby but he must be talking to you i'm like they're the baby powder and nobody knew what had just happened to me right yeah paul wilbur um but that was the very first time that at least the good scent um that i could smell right and look we got six kids now four kids later and after that it, it took so long for me to get pregnant between elijah and Jeremiah, that after that had happened and um, all that in the church, every two years, I was pregnant. Four times every two years. When the, each child got 18 months, almost like clockwork, I got pregnant again. You know, so I'm just like, this is, this is amazing. Like, I'll never forget that. I will never forget that. Um, so, but it's, it's all, all kinds of stuff. The very first time I actually smelled, um, like a smell not too nice i was really young i had to have been about maybe like seven maybe eight may yeah maybe we were living out tanner's creek in the townhouse this was before we moved away to go to illinois where i was there for like the next 10 or so years joined the military and got stationed back here um i had to have been Maybe, maybe I was a little bit older. Because Tanner Street, I was, no, maybe I was like 11. No, nope. 10, 10 or 11, I'll say. But I actually smelled like burning sulfur. And I had woken up from a dream where it seemed like a, it seemed like it was really real. But there were two, what I would classify as demons, you know, because it was really black. In my mind, what I understood demons to be like these creatures, pointy ears and stuff on the top of the head pills with like you see on cartoons right that was my only point of reference so that's what i saw i saw two of them and they were at the head of my bed it was like they was trying to get in my head and i kept smacking them away i'm like get out of here go get out of here you know and it was like they trying to they just kept they couldn't penetrate but they kept trying and i just kept shooing them away and then i got really upset and I started pinching them. I'm like, get out of here. And I was asleep, but I was in that in-between state. You know, are you waking up from sleep and you waking up? But as I began to come to, I was still doing that. And when I woke up, I realized I was pinching my pillow, but I could smell it. It smelled like burning sulfur. I'm like, and so I'm looking under my pillow. I was like, oh my gosh, was demons really in here? I'm like, oh my gosh, I couldn't go back to sleep. And I was scared for weeks about that thing. Um... And so I'm just like, man, and I, I, I don't know y'all, <laughs> I had all kind of crazy supernatural things happen to where now it's like coming across a wasp. It's like a breath of fresh air and it answers a whole, it doesn't answer every question, but it answers a whole lot of stuff that I've experienced in dreams, out of dreams, out of body, in body, 
it, visions, different things I, I hear that I smell. It's like, I know nothing in here is burning. Why is that? And I did. When I look around my room and stuff, and I walk through the house. My mom was still asleep. I think my dad was at work or something or whatever. But walking through, making sure we're nothing on fire, the way I had to go wake up my mom. But all of these things are like, this is crazy. Look, intuitive goat. Deshaun. This, this stuff is crazy. I love, I love, like, I be... Susan B. Martinez, I be sucking up her material because it helps me put a lot of different things I've experienced into perspective way more than any kind of information and help that I've ever gotten while I've been in church. And even when I was in church seeking for answers, that's why I would join different things. Like when they would have a class about um, um, uh, um, like religion, like all of this stuff, especially when they had like these uh, the, the deliverance courses and stuff. And like the school of the prophets, I was like, maybe they got some answers. And I will go to all of these. I got all kinds of certificates of things that I've been in trying to figure out what the heck has been happening to me, you know. So, um, but it's been an awesome experience and education. And this right now is like, I don't know, it's, I definitely learned something going through those things. But here, I'm seeming to be able to bring a lot of this stuff together. From every place in life that I've been, it's just, it's, it's, it's amazing. This amazing one that's not, but hey, girl, hey. Okay, let me, um, let's just go ahead and finish this chapter real quick. What is it? It's 804. Okay. All right, let's finish this. Okay. Page 111. We just talked about how, um, the FBI put together this, uh, this, uh, profile of James Wood. Uh, I'm sorry. Idaho. No, that was the... Anyway, they put together this uh, profile of the killer who they was looking for. They said, our man would be a loner, strange and compulsive, possessed of a beer belly, driving a beater, and possibly walking with a limp. The limp, though, may be different from the physical deformity suggested by the profilers. It may not be organic at all, but more like the, quote, slight limp, end quote, noticed in Chocotelo, Russia's, Russia's Red Ripper, Conradi, 1992, page 94, or the, excuse me, or the perplexing, painful limp acquired by Danny Starrett. The disassociative limp, it had started for Danny in childhood, along with other symptoms of overshadowing, headaches, dizziness, blackouts, quote, whisperings, end quote, and obsessive automatic drawing of sadistic scenes no amount of doctors or tests could explain any of it most alarming was that leg which would slip out from under him his left leg was not growing as fast as the other one the situation the situation may be comparable to dr crabtree's obsessed patient karen an adolescent whose limp was also without medical cause and it has an asterisk after medical cause. And at the bottom it says, this difficulty is comparable to cases of hysterical lameness so common in the 19th century. In 1857, for example, a patient named Betsy Cook, unable to walk, was brought before a healer, medium, having been diagnosed with nervous spasms, hysteria. The healer did her magic and Miss Cook got up and walked. All right, go back up. Like Danny asked, she experienced both pain in and shortening of the left leg. Fortunately for Karen, an exorcism was performed. Danny was not so lucky. Accounts of crippling caused by spirit interference stretch from biblical times, Luke chapter 13, verse 11, to the case book of Dr. Pierre Janet, who preceded Dr. Freud and, in fact, coined the word disassociation. In one of Janet's cases, it was reported that, quote, the demon twisted his patient's arms and legs, end quote. Ooh, this just reminded me of something. <clears throat> so remember this church I told y'all earlier, one of the best churches I had been in, right, where I learned a lot of spiritual things. When I was there, I had this dream. This just reminded me of that. <clears throat> I had this dream. While the pastor was preaching, there was, and it was a small church. The pastor was preaching, and um, there was, I don't know, a special service or something. But anyway, the church was packed. Like, there was 
all the seats were filled. And so while he was up there teaching, while he was up there teaching, I began to notice like commotion <clears throat> in the uh in the in the in the congregation. And it seemed like nobody else noticed it, but I did. And it was at this point where I got up because it was it wasn't disturbing. Like I said, nobody else noticed it. The pastor kept right on preaching, but I noticed in different spots in the congregation, it would seem like this commotion and people just kind of like, mm, like something like they're trying to get up or something, but they can't. So I got up and I walked out of the congregation and I walked to get a better view to see what was going on. And as I went to the side, it was like I saw x-rays on these different people where the commotions was coming from. And then I'm looking, and then the pastor said, and this, this is a dream, the pastor said, come up here so you can see better. And so I came up there, and I stood in the pulpit right beside him at the podium, and I began to look. And with the different people, I saw, like, it was like I could see what was wrong with them. There was, like, a red x-ray over, like, a few different people in the audience. And somebody was having issues with the heart and the x-ray, where, wherever the x-ray was at, it showed where the problem was that they was having. You couldn't see it naturally, right? You had to have had spiritual eyes to see this. And there was like the, it was like enlarged too. So it was like a, a square. Um, Y'all know what x-rays look like when they come out and they put them on the board so you can look at it. But it was like that over them. And I could see it. And the x-rays were red. And there was this one person who had it like over their head. And when you looked at the x-ray, there was like this monkey sitting on their shoulders like like you would take a child put them on your shoulders like this with legs straddling around each side of the head there was a monkey sitting on this person's shoulders and had the legs like you know somebody said child get on your neck and they crossed their legs the legs were crossed around the neck and they had the hands around the head and they was just like going to work on that person's head and they was having like mental issues and stuff and i could see um Everything that was happening with them people where the commotion was going, I understood, okay, this is what the commotion is about. But if you look at them with normal eyes, they just sitting there paying attention to the message or whatever. I was like, oh, that is interesting. This just reminded me of that. It says right here, in one of Janet's cases, it was reported that, quote, the demon twisted his patient's arm and legs. And it just, end quote, and that reminded me of the monkey on top of that person's shoulders like going to work trying to twist their head and biting them in the head and stuff that's crazy and in the sad german case 1970s of the possessed college girl annalise michael her quote limbs contorted in a grotesque way end quote at other times her legs would become stiff like sticks goodman 1981 page 162 similarly in haiti participants in the transpossession cult are known to go completely stiff-limbed fd see page 68 i forget who fd was um page 68 they described who fd is fd is oh former devotee for reference sake i will call her fd meaning former devotee okay fd see page 68 also possessed stated quote I have been told by both priests and psychiatrists that I had a case of demonic possession. It somehow is able to injure me physically so bad that I have been barely able to walk, end quote. In every part of the world, quote, problems with the locomotive faculties have been observed among the possessed, end quote. Crapazano and Garrison, 1977, page 94. This mysterious dysfunction also turns up among OCs, obsessive compulsives, like Daryl, who, for some reason, walked, quote, stiffly, end quote. Rappaport, 1989, page 87. Among autistic kids, too, are those who exhibit robot-like movements or who feel like, quote, cement, end quote, or who coordinate their limbs only with the most extreme and willful effort. Most significantly, autistics regularly report feeling, quote, disconnected, end quote, from their bodies. Some of the most compelling instances of the disassociative limp come from the case studies in MPD. On several occasions, Billy Milligan, with 24 different personalities on board, was unable to walk without assistance. Another male, another male multiple, Henry Hawksworth, 
had an altar with a, quote, peculiar walk, end quote. Dr. Crabtree's multiple patient, Maria, quote, was unable to walk normally, end quote. The multiple Kit C with seven altars also had trouble moving her legs. We have reason to believe that any form of spirit control may affect the organism, limbs in particular. A poltergeist focal agent, age 16, is found to have a, quote, funny walk, end quote. And back in the day when home seances were popular, quote, sitters, end quote, for physical phenomena, physical phenomena, 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 and PK, psychokinesis, sometimes reacted with spasmodic jerks of the limbs. The jerking, it was believed, was caused by a reaction in their bodies. The sitters now harnessed as hosts for the materialization. And the same sort of spasms are noticeable among psychopaths. Coincidence? Coincidence? I don't think so. For example, something was wrong with the shoemaker's walk. His unsteady, quote, shuffling, end quote, he walked with strange jerky movements, end quote. Schreber, 1984, page 323 and 371. We almost done. Page 113. Let us take a moment to search like this unique clue, the overshadowed gate. And it's given a list of different people with this crazy looking walk. Richard Chase, quote, the vampire of Sacramento moved unsteadily from place to place, shuffling and dragging one foot, end quote. Markman and Bosco, 1989, page 188. And page 170. Cho, the Virginia Tech shooter. Y'all remember him? Cho, the Virginia Tech shooter, 2007, had undiagnosable trouble with his legs. One girlfriend of Fred Cole, compulsive rapist, noticed, quote, the slight unga ungainliness of his rolling walk, end quote. Olson, 1983, page 61. California's notorious Zodiac lumbered, California's notorious Zodiac lumbered along, quote, like a bear, end quote. John Liss, familicide, had a, quote, bouncy, awkward gait, end quote. Sharky, 1990, page 288. Jeff McDonald, also familicide, quote, shuffled like an old man, end quote. McGinnis, 1983, page 376. Melvin Reese, Maryland area serial killer, nine victims, had a, quote, strange gait, end quote. He waddled like a duck. Timothy McVeigh had an, quote, awkward strut, end quote. Arthur Shawcross, at age 10, had come down with, quote, a mysterious malady crippling his legs, end quote. Olson, 1993, page 445. Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, had, quote, a stiff walk, end quote. Burn, 1985, page 48. Peter Woodcock, Toronto serial killer, had, quote, a strange walk, end quote. Hey. You gotta be dressed. Okay. <sighs> okay. All right. All right, y'all. Uh, so we got to pause. We almost, we was almost done, but we'll pick this back up tomorrow. We got a truck coming to the warehouse, but I did want to say something. I thought about this. I'm not sure if this has anything to do with it, but do y'all think, do y'all think, uh, Kevin, I just saw that. I'm going to talk about it in a second. Do y'all think that these people with these strange gates, do y'all think, it doesn't matter. Do y'all think that maybe they they were when they start having these uh strange walks like they waddling like a duck do you think maybe it's their native spirit the one that's been put in a sunken place maybe trying to fight back against the spirit that's trying to take over you know like uh like struggling like they when they they because they say that um it's like the whatever it is from the outside coming in just completely takes over. You think they might be trying to fight back, trying to go in the other direction? Like like this one killer, I forget the name from the previous page, it said this this spirit already has its victims in view. I don't know who they are yet. Maybe y'all can help because I can't stop them. 
you know, so I'm, I'm wondering. Yes, babe. My legs don't want to walk. What? My legs don't want to walk. Your legs don't want to walk. What was you just doing? You pro They probably fell asleep. <laughs> All right, have a seat. It's interesting. Here, have, have a seat right here, my baby. My grandbabies came over here this weekend, and they brought the sniffles and stuff with them. So now, they sniffling and stuff, and um, ain't nobody got no temperature. But Bella was up coughing, I'm like, oh. see, it's different because we don't have, we don't. Although they will catch little colds and stuff here and there, but you know, in school, everybody bringing all kinds of everything and taking back home, and the Elijah's children are actually in school you know so it's like every weekend or every other weekend they got some kind of cough and stuff that they bring in here i'm about to be like listen when they come we need to quarantine them but it's hard to keep them away from each other you know they all small and stuff and they want to play and they come in and run right to the loft you know so i'm like uh, you know so that's why i bought them bags of grapes the seeded grapes so they can eat them i'm like chew up the seeds too chew the seeds too i was like listen the healing is in the seeds Chew the seeds if you can. You ain't got to chew all of them, but chew some of them. And I was juicing it yesterday, just trying to kick it, you know. So and that's why I can trying to I can kind of feel it trying to attack me. But I got some I got some bitters um, in here. I got I got a couple different types of bitters. I'm gonna boil these and I'm gonna you know start running it through again. Um, but the kids they don't I can't get them to take the bitters. They like no, that's nasty. We're not doing it. So I gotta juice the fruit and stuff for them this kick this thing out but yeah so i'm one I'm, I'm wondering though if this has anything to do with it maybe not but you know it i'm, I'm curious i'm curious about it you know if it could be the native spirit trying to fight back against the the intruding spirit that's coming in trying to get them to go in directions or the guy um who said uh he would he would see the young girl or whatever and then she'd get off the expressway he'd follow behind you know i know that's the hands are moving but still you eventually gonna have to get out this car and follow whoever this um possible next victim could be right but back to what kevin said he said um maybe that's where a monkey on my back comes from it absolutely could be right i thought about that you know it would be plausible right deshaun you know so i don't know i'm just curious let me look into it all right but we gotta pause right here y'all I gotta, I gotta get them dressed and get head out of here and get up to the office. All right. Um, page number. We definitely gonna finish this tomorrow because it's like a page and a half left, and then we start chapter five. I shall walk the sky. We go back here. What it do? What? Oh. I put it in the wrong spot. Mom. That's why. Mom. Yes, babe. I can it. Yeah. Page 44. That's what it is. Okay. All right, beautiful people. It is Monday, November the 21st, 2022, day 269 of year four of reading through the books of the law and the prophets and of the four year consecutive day count, day 1,288. We read in Oaspe, Book of Ashong, Son of Jehovah, pages 42 to page 44. And then we read a little bit more of chapter four, chapter four, Paul. Soul Murder. And feel God to the spirit world, pages 103 to 1. We didn't read all that, did we? He did. We did. Page 104 to 113. That was a lot. Probably because a couple of charts and the bullet points. Yeah, that was a lot. Okay. All right, y'all. So that was it. We'll pick this back up tomorrow. Thank y'all for hanging out. Father, we thank you that you are higher than we are. We thank you that you have the bird's eye view when you can teach us a higher light from your position. All right? I love it. All right, y'all, that's it. Um, everybody, if I missed anybody, shalom. If I missed a comment or question, I don't think I missed any questions. Set apart, say you smell lilacs. It's been a while now. You seen Paul Wilbur perform a couple times? She down here. Not yet. <gasps> the days of Elijah. I love that. Days of Elijah by him set apart. Okay, y'all, that's it. I don't see any other questions.
Dawn, she said, girl, I enjoy your spirit. Thank you, thank you for educating me. My wasp journey is just beginning. Oh, that's amazing. Keep going, girl. All right, y'all, we got to get out of here. Oh, you, you ready, ready. All right, I love y'all. Got to go. See y'all back here tomorrow morning, bright and early, 6.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Peace. Go ahead, Tootie. You end it. I woke up so early to do that. I woke up so early.